Happy Friday, everybody. Heck yeah. It's not Monday. Oh, that's right. <laughs> it's not Monday at all. <laughs> I feel like I should uh, put a put, put a pin on your shirt for every time you don't call it Monday. <laughs> yeah. A little golden star. Hi, right, everybody. We're going to start the Weird Things program in just a few minutes. Just moments. Moments, even. How's your Friday going? Uh, Pretty good. So far, so good. Uh, buckling in for uh, more, more. It's hot. It's hot. You guys, breaking <laughs> news alert. It's hot. And it's hot, too. <laughs> And it's been hot lately. Yeah. That's the crazy thing about it. Ah, that's my favorite time of the year is when I can pull out that one joke from Pootie Tang. Which is? And it's hot, too. Oh, I, I didn't know that was it a joke. It is hot today. Uh, so hot. <laughs> yeah, and it's hot, too. <laughs> Dan, Dan, what's your uh, Twitter handle? Prof Simons. Okay, got it. At Prof Simons on Mastodon. He's on the Mastodon. I am, but I'll, don't use it a whole lot. Uh, on the Don. Yeah. Man, yeah. I'll tell you what. It's like, uh, 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 be careful what you wish for. What we all wished for was, oh, well, well, if only there was an alternative to Twitter. Is that what we wished for? And now, dang, if we have all of them. a lot of them. <laughs> See, and, uh, threads, thread, threads activity down 50% from last weekend. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, given that they only needed to have people push a button to, to add yeah. up to that first number. Yeah. Yeah. Grand opening, grand closing. That's right. Oh, did you if see that furniture store up the street? follow your followers, it'd be fine. Yeah. yeah. Did you see that, that furniture store up the street is no longer in their grand opening after like no. seven years? Wow. <laughs> I forgot that they were doing that. Yeah. <laughs> they had a huge grand opening sign out front. They just took it down. I hope that they stay open another seven years, but it's going out of business. Going out of business the next seven years. <laughs> the next seven years. Yeah. Everything must go. All right. You folks want to do some weird things? Yeah. Hey, let's go. Twitch.tv slash nine attack. Right? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Boom. Then uh, I'll count us in uh, and I'll start the show. Uh, yeah, I was about to say. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll, 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 I'll toss to you. Okay, cool. All right, here we go. We'll start the weird things program in three. Oh, hold on. Andrew just said he solved it. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, hey, uh, Dan, I think it's going to be great because the episode's going to be five minutes. Uh, <laughs> it's just going to be, we're going to take up the entire time that he has carved do, out doing the, the, text the, the text for. Uh, uh, <laughs> Dan, the, the first time I saw the Invisible Gorilla clip was in 2003 at the Amazing Meeting. Mm -hmm. you, you didn't happen to be there, were you? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, be, be, because uh, years before we would become friends and the show would start, uh, it turns out that both uh, Justin and Andrew mm -hmm. were there, and and I was oh, just wow. you know it's certainly the first the time that I saw it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Andrew, can you speak for us? How does I? How do I sound? Hey. You sound great. You sound good. Can I have you count? Hey. Can I have you count to ten for me? Oh, and you took your AirPods out and your yeah, video turned uh, off. I know. I had. I'm only getting your audio one here. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, oh. four, three, two, one. Awesome. Can you meet yourself okay. in Google Meet as well? Because that sounds good. Yeah. So uh, the Elgato USB. Mm -hmm. It's that's the problem. I disconnected this mic, and for some reason, this the Elgato mic was giving us problem. Maybe because I'm plugged into the monitor. So oh. my end. My apologies. I, I, Normally, I, I, we're a much I've more actually, polished operation than this, Dan. The, as soon as you left, I was like, I think it might be a core audio thing because I've actually had Mac issues with core audio of uh, different things being plugged in and, and stuff getting knocked off. So uh, uh, I'm glad we figured it out. Yeah. Okay. Well, then uh, uh, we can jump right into the show then if you're ready to go, Andrew. We were just, you, 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 you beat it just at the nick of time. Literally in the countdown. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 called a, I called a friend and said, let's go run through this. Tell, help me test this right now. So. Oh, that's great. Awesome. awesome. Well, then uh, I'll get the video stuff sorted out once we get started here. All right, wait, quick. Oh, yes. Once again, how do you want to be introduced? Oh, uh, Dan? You asking, oh for, uh, for Dan. You're asking me here? Yeah. 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 Uh, it doesn't matter. matter. Do you, uh, if you mention the book, that's ideal. Um, but just... Uh, okay, do, 
you can say Daniel Simons, Dan Simons. I normally in conversation am Dan. But but, but so it doesn't really matter. Who you're I'm. a professor at which university? University of Illinois. Okay, and and best known as a co-creator of the most famous viral video of all time. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna let Brian do the introduction. Brian, yeah, you're gonna yeah. open the show. Okay. <laughs> We went from me opening the show to now Brian opening the show. I think I oh, should open the open show. Actually, I actually, you want to open the show once, Justin? Just no, it. you want to know what? I'm not. <laughs> Brian, you should do it. Oh, doggone it! I've never, I've <laughs> never opened the show before. All right. Oh, that's right. You haven't. Okay. Yeah, count me in. All right. What can go wrong? All right, Andrew or Brian, on a Monday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, Brian. Uh, I'll count you in for the Weird Things program in three, two. Welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I am your host, as always, as I always have been since the first episode, Brian Brushwood. I am joined by the incredible Justin Robert Young. Hello. Bryce Castillo. Hello. Andrew Main. Present. <laughs> this all hey. feels very odd, it, which is weird because it's been this way for 15 years. Uh, and we, You're doing great, sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we are joined by uh, a, a, an illuminary of skepticism, somebody whose work I first encountered at the very same conference that I did not meet either of you two guys. <laughs> Despite the fact that we were all there. This, uh, at uh, 2003's uh, The Amazing Meeting, uh, Professor Dan Simons from uh, University of Illinois, correct? Yep. Uh, a, 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 a co-creator of The Invisible Gorilla. Uh, uh, real quick, I, I assume that a lot of people, uh, when you explain the thing that you're best known for, how do you usually put it? A uh, video in which a person walks through a basketball game and thumps his chest and people don't notice it. That's, That's okay. Uh, all of this simple is description totally of accurate. Uh, and yep. and uh, uh, you guys ended up writing a book, uh, uh, The Invisible Gorilla, that uh, mm -hmm. uh, did very, very well. And uh, mm -hmm. part of the reason that we're having this discussion now is because you, uh, through our mutual friend, David McCraney over at You Are Not So Smart, uh, I, I, I got early access to read your new book, uh, Nobody's Fool, which is all about how we get deceived and how to prevent ourselves from doing so. Is that right? That's pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. So I've already read the book. Um, uh, I don't want to leave. Why, why do you guys do this last? <laughs> I've never once hosted this show. It's fine. You're, you're here now. You <laughs> yes, did all no, the hard you part. Did the, you you just asked great. him a question. All right. You're doing great, sweetie. You're doing great. <laughs> yeah. No, just... Andrew, do you have any questions? Wait. No, 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 no. Don't bail out. <laughs> don't bail out. You can just. Uh, it's the easiest question in the world. It's just what gave you the idea to write the book. It's okay. simple. Just ask him that. I just had a thought in my mind. Dan, what gave you the idea to write the book? Wow, what, what an original question. I've never heard that before. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, we, uh, we actually started thinking about writing another book shortly after the last one, but that was more than a dozen years ago. And uh, we really didn't have a clear idea of what the theme would be. So. We just kind of gathered materials and found things that we found interesting and cataloged a whole bunch of notes. And it took until maybe three years ago before we kind of figured out what the organizing theme was. And we realized that there are tons of books, podcast stories, uh, some of them are the world's greatest ones about cons <laughs> right? and about deception and about frauds. And the vast majority of them focus on the fact that they're just amazing stories, right? There's there's just a great narrative structure to the grand con. Um, but what very few of the books and articles do is focus on why it is across all of these different types of scams and cons, we consistently get deceived and looking at the commonalities across all of them to see what is it about us that makes us likely to be victimized by these sorts of things. I, I would imagine that a lot of it would be familiar to you in, in your uh, academic work, um, but uh, what was the biggest surprise for you as you guys were collecting all these pieces and realizing the unifying theme throughout them? Uh, or, or, was there one story that's your favorite? Um, I'm not sure that I'd pick out a single story that was 
you know, our favorite overall. There are just so many great ones. Um, one, one story that I particularly like uh, is, isn't really a con or a scam in sort of a grand way. It was a story from a chess tournament where a guy shows up to play in this tournament. Nobody's seen him before. Nobody's heard of him before, but he registered as John von Neumann, right? Not, not the real John von Neumann, but that was a pseudonym that he was using when he registered. And in his first round, he drew a grandmaster. And then he did well enough across the entire tournament to, uh, to win prize money. But it was pretty clear to all of the experts who were watching that he didn't actually know how to play chess. And it's kind of an odd thing that these experts are very familiar with what expert chess players look like when they move pieces. I mean, they, they pause it at times that make sense, right, for long positions. They won't pause much in the opening because they kind of know the opening, so they'll play their moves really quickly. The way they physically move their pieces and hit their clock is really consistent. I mean, expert players just are smoother in their movements. And he was kind of choppy, and then he'd pause for really long times at the beginning of the game, and then in a really complicated position, he wouldn't pause as much, and then sometimes he just let his time run out and walked away, you know, ended up leaving the, losing the game. And it just didn't make a whole lot of sense. So everybody was getting suspicious about it. And a few people talked to the tournament director and said, you know, this seems weird. Um, we don't know what's going on, but there are a lot of hypotheses. One was that he was hiding a headphone headset underneath his hair and was getting moves from a computer. And that whenever he wasn't uh, making a move, it was because there was a glitch in the transmission. This was a long time ago. Um, so the director of the tournament, after it was over, said, OK, you know, I'm hesitant to give you your prize money because you know, there's a lot of suspicion about you. So here's a problem. And he set up a very simple chess problem that a relatively beginning player could solve immediately. And he stormed, stormed away, got upset, and walked out. Didn't collect his prize money. Right. He, he couldn't solve like a basic mate in checkmate in two sort of problem. Um, would, would, would it be a fair comparison to say that essentially this guy was suspicious enough that he was failing the chess Turing test, so yep. somebody set up a CAPTCHA and he couldn't solve the CAPTCHA and so he got up and left? That's exactly right. And you know, just all it took was asking him to test his abilities and see if you can do it. And as soon as they tested his abilities without the possibility of there being a computer feeding him in, you know, feeding him moves, he, he just crashed and burned. Did um, so it's an interesting case because it's unlike a lot of other scams and cons in that all of the people around him were suspicious. It just didn't make sense, right? That this guy out of nowhere, I mean, there were people who came out of nowhere and played really well, but they were typically people coming in from former Soviet bloc who hadn't played in tournaments in America, but were really, really strong players. Um, but he was just coming in and, you know, unknown as an American and just, you know, beating and, and playing well against really strong players. Did, uh, 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 I, I assume that they never found out exactly the mechanical way he was able to access what I assume was a computer helping him? No, my co-author Chris Chabri has done a lot of digging. He's very well connected in the chess community and has been doing a lot of digging to try and find people who were there and to try and find evidence of it. Um, but no, I mean, there's basically guesses. I mean, there were other things that were happening, like there was a guy who would occasionally come out and look at his game and then disappear again. And the thought was that he was coming out to try and check what the position was in case there was some sort of miscommunication mm. in order to update the moves. Um, but, you know, this was in the 90s. So there, the transmission capabilities and wireless mics and things like that were just not quite as good. Um, so but, so you know, certainly, certainly not the kind of technology yeah. that was in play with our most recent chess cheating scam. I, I was trying really hard not to bring it up, but, but, but. yeah, <laughs> yeah, there, there, there was a lot of speculation about that. What's interesting there is that there, there's really not that much documentary evidence there of what happened yeah. and if anything happened at all. Right. I mean, Magnus Carlsen kind of implied that Hans Neumann was, was cheating. Um, but there's not really direct evidence of it. I mean, there's plenty of cheating in, in chess, especially online chess, but in those high level matches, it'd be a challenge to cheat. And it's not at all clear what happened in that case. Uh, you know, Hans Niemann is, is suing uh, Carlson for, you know, for slander, basically. Oh, wow. Um, and it's it's a ongoing kind of, ex, you know, extracurricular sorts of decisions about what's going on in that case. But um, there are plenty of other cases of chess cheating that we talk about in the book. Um, a lot of the online ones you can kind of flag in other ways, right? So people make moves that are just too consistent or too good over time. 
What, and, what happened and, and in the that, Neiman that, That's yeah. one of the themes that I really, really enjoyed uh, throughout the book is, um, uh, you know, the, the emphasis on numbers, uh, suspicious mm -hmm. regularity, uh, the fact that yeah. in the story that you just told, the fact that he took, you know, about as long to make his opening move as his very complicated late game move. Um, there's uh, there's there's kind of a bombastic story, and I don't know how much you are able to share about it, but there was a moment when I was reading this book that it looked like there was a academic brouhaha because numbers implied that a, 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 a correct me if I'm stating this incorrectly, but but there was a study that claimed to have a certain sample size but the numbers didn't uh, behave the way they should if that sample size was that big. Would, would that be a good way to put it? Yeah, I mean, there are plenty of studies that have that problem, right? So lots of fraudulent studies, the numbers don't act the way that you would expect them to when you really dig into what's underlying them. So I, I think you're referring to uh, a, what's now a fairly famous case just from a year ago in, in my field um, of a study that was a really prominent study claiming that there was a, an advantage, you had less cheating if people signed before they did something than if they signed afterwards. So if you um, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before you testify, the argument was that leads you to be less likely to cheat. Whereas if you sign at the end, let's say you fill out your taxes and sign at the end and say, these are honest reporting, um, that you're more likely to cheat in that context. Um, so the finding was from uh, a field study uh, looking at an insurance company. and. The claim was that this insurance company did a study where they mailed out uh, requests for people to certify what their current odometer reading was. And they either signed that they were going to be honest at the beginning of before they gave the report or after they gave the report. And what they claimed was that people reported that their mileage was greater when they signed at the end. In other, uh, sorry, when they signed at the beginning, meaning that they were giving a more honest report because underestimating your mileage would make the insurance rates cheaper. Um, so they compared what the odometer readings were at some point in the past when they had actual odometer readings to what these self-reports were and said that people who signed first were less likely to uh, were, were less likely to cheat. They were less likely to underestimate their mileage. And this was a, a big finding, right? It was a prominent finding. And in the proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences, which is one of the top uh, the most visible journals in our field. And what's interesting about that case is about a year or so ago, um, a group that runs the blog site called Data Collada um, basically documented that the study was fraudulent. And I, the fraud in it was yeah, that- how, how did they figure that yeah. out? Well, one of, one of the most clear cut signs for me, I think, is that let's say you look at how many miles people drive in a year, right? Typically drive in a year. You know, most people will drive between, say, five and 15,000 miles in a year, right? Not 50,000, not 250, but around, you know, five to 15,000. So there's going to be a peak. If you look at the 100,000 people, there's going to be a lot of people in that five to 15,000 range and not very many driving more than, you know, 20,000 miles or 30,000 miles. But if you look at the actual data from that study, what it looks like is a flat line. People driving 500 miles were just as likely as people driving 5,000 or 10,000 or 15,000 or 50,000, oh. right? And almost nobody drives 50,000 miles in their car that they have insurance for, right? That's just very, very few people. And there was not a single one above 50,000. So 49,000 was just as likely as 10,000, but 50,000, once you got to 50,000, there was zero. So it was just a flat drop off at 50,000. And so- uh, Data don't look like that. Yeah. So the controversy is that um, uh, uh, that this was a published article <laughs> that that uh, the, we, 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 mm. the very prominent authors on this article. Um, okay. And uh, what's interesting about it is that all of the authors, so you know, the, all of the authors of this article, uh, every single one of them acknowledges that the data are fraudulent. Okay. This is a, an unusual case. So this was the article has been retracted. Everybody acknowledges that yes, this were fraud. There are other things in the data too. For example, there were two different fonts used for the data in the Excel spreadsheet, and the it was pretty clear that what happened was 
uh, all of the data in one font was just duplicated versions of the data in the other font with a random amount of variability added in to try and hide it. So, wow. so, um, so this there were lots of red flags here. Yeah. So they admitted that, that they just yep. intentionally, uh, uh well, fudged this data. They admitted that the data no. were fudged. That's okay. the interesting thing. So everybody acknowledges that the data are fraudulent. Nobody will claim responsibility for who did it. Um, so the only person who originally interacted with the insurance company to get the data is Dan Ariely. Um, but he says he got the data from the insurance company and something was wrong with it. Um, the insurance company hasn't really responded. Um, so somewhere in the process of data collection, data transmission, data analysis, writing it up, the data became, you know, fabricated. Uh, but but uh, they, they have taken responsibility for not uh, identifying these patterns that random people on the internet yep. did identify. Yeah. Yeah. I'm random data sleuths who are really, really good at this sure. and are very careful in how they do it. Um, but yes, that, that's right. Uh, they, they've taken responsibility. They said, yeah, there's something clearly wrong here. We didn't realize it. We should have paid closer attention. Um, we're pulling this paper from the literature. It's not, it's no longer a part of the scientific record because it's clearly fabricated data. So, so they acknowledge this, but nobody quite knows who did it or when or how. When I, when I worked with uh, James Randi, I used to handle the million dollar prize and for psychic powers and stuff. And yeah. you know, one of the first things they do, it's Benford's law. You look at the data of people who are reading the SP cards to see like you could, you could statistically spot manufactured data. But when you dug a little right. bit deeper, sometimes you'd find out in a lab, there might be four or five well-intentioned people, and there might be one researcher who's overworked or under the gun or whatever, who decides, and not, ultimately it is malicious, but not maliciously, but they do right. decide, well, we know, we have enough signal, I can just, we need, we know, we know in our heart that this is true, I can sort of yeah. amplify this data or things, and that happened a lot, it would just be a lot, and you can sometimes pinpoint, uh, was this person, or my favorite one was uh, one of these parapsychology labs, had a subject that was getting unusually high scores at predicting a like a random number generator, extremely high, mm -hmm. you know, but they're only listed as subject S. Um, subject S was probably a researcher who worked in the lab and or possibly the person that actually coded the random number generator. Yeah. And what's suspicious to us, to the people in the lab, like, no, you know, that's so-and-so. We trust them. Like, it's all good. Yeah. Well, and that's that's one of the big dangers here, right? That the research process depends on trusting your collaborators, right? It, it's a necessary part of it because these are often large studies with lots of people involved, and it's really hard to be an expert at all of the different aspects of it. So it's quite common to have different people analyze the data, different people design the experiment. In principle, everybody should be involved in all of those processes, at least aware of what happened and approved it. Um, but yeah, you often depend on trust and the incentive structure is really aligned to get these big papers and get these big publications. So you ima imagine you're working in a lab that wants to publish big flashy findings. And when a graduate student brings a result to them, it's like, oh yeah, look at this really cool result. That person's gonna be really happy, right? They're gonna run with it and be approving of that graduate student. They'll get letters of recommendation. What about the student who never can get those results, right? What happens to them, right? They're gonna be the one who doesn't have flair Right. So they're going to be the one who doesn't succeed. And it, that sort of reinforcement of only the big, you know, cool findings, everything working, creates an incentive structure where you end up getting false results. It's a real problem. We may, we may have be seeing an example of that real time with the origins of COVID, where, you know, recent letters have come to light of people being told like, yeah, we'll give you some funding. We just kind of got to kind of all agree on this one point of view right now which is yeah. scary to see it at that level. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I tend to be a little wary of that level of conspiracy, global conspiracy, because it's, it is pretty hard to kind you, of no, coordinate. Have you seen the latest yeah. stuff, the, yeah. the Fauci correspondence? Have you seen the correspondence mm -hmm. where literally the, the funding that went to the Harvard right after they did that? I mean, I'm not, it, that, the yeah. evidence is pretty, pretty, pretty warrants yeah. a deeper investigation there. And the stuff that came out in the last week was just, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's there there are a ton of people involved in this field, and not all of them are receiving. We're receiving funding at that moment, and yeah. it, I think it's a little more complicated in that in that case. And I'm not an expert on it, but um, you know, there's there are a lot of differences of opinion there. Um, 
Well, I, would, I think I, there, I think there are plenty more cases where yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, incentives are a big the, issue. The, yeah, yeah, the most the most important science case in the last hundred years. To me, it's like we want to talk about what – and I, I believe in the best intentions of people, and I do. But I think that mm-hmm. we talk about incentives, though. This is clearly a case where the first we go, they don't have incentives, and we realize, well, this is very – all the funding and the way these labs get funded, the network there, mm-hmm. the people who approve the funding, it's your friend that approves this other thing. And now we're seeing stuff I was surprised to see, like, oh, my God, that's – that seems to be, like, a huge conflict of interest. And it just – I'm just saying mm-hmm. that these things scale up. It's not just, you know, did this yeah. insurance company do this? The most important science question of the last oh, yeah. 100 years seems to be maybe a victim of this. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's really important to look at funding sources, um, especially when people have a vested interest in making one one claim or another, right? Uh, mm-hmm. The you know, with with large science conspiracies, they're often really hard to hold together because relatively few people get funding, right? So it's not the case that all of the people who are taking one side or the other side of a, of a debate like that are getting funded or not getting funded, right? As a result of, of that. A so lot of them aren't even applying for funding. That, long- I would say it's the reputa- part of it's the reputational thing is that you had an mm-hmm. situation where part, part of the incentives are reputational. And if, if, mm-hmm. you're, if you're directing funding towards a lab and all of a sudden, there's an accident there, whatever, you stay in a reputational, mm-hmm. you know, hit. And uh, that's, mm-hmm. you see people who, you know, reputation power is all parts of incentives. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, yeah. along those lines, uh, the the book is, is uh, I, what I enjoyed most about the book is uh, identifying when you're being snowed, identifying the red flags that you might want to walk right past, and then also identifying best practices to avoid being put in that right. position. And a lot of them are uh, uh, kind of uncomfortable things. Like, uh, you know, society mm-hmm. runs like uh, when 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 somebody's pulled over on the side of the road with a broken down car and is flagging me down, I don't assume that they're secretly, you know, about to perform a terrorist act or something. I, I, mm-hmm. I, I, uh, 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 tell me a, b- a little bit about the, uh, uh, what are the red flags that you guys ident- identify in this book and what are some of the counterintuitive, uh, checks that, that most people yeah. should implement to not get fooled? Well, here's, here's one that's somewhat counterintuitive, which is that when you find something that matches your expectations, right? So you're looking for evidence of something and you find things that are consistent with it, uh, or somebody provides you with evidence and forwards something that sounds completely in line with what you what you were expecting to see. Um, that's when you should actually be the most skeptical, most likely, because oh. that's when we're not de- by default very skeptical. We tend to kind of accept stuff that's consistent with what we want and to be really hypercritical of things that are different from what we want. So it's really important to kind of realize that when you're given something, say on social media, somebody forwards something that's like, yeah, that's perfectly aligned with my perspective on things, which is the vast majority of what most of us will see on social media because we follow people who have similar beliefs. That's when you're most likely to be uncritical and forward something that turns out to be wrong. Well, that's you know, so from, from, that's the real challenge. From my perspective as a a once upon a time reporter, that that was an instinct that I had to build, oftentimes yeah. through the hard way because yeah. I would get information. The information was either really exciting or uh, uh, very novel yeah. and uh, uh, you know, you run with it or, and, and sometimes I remember one instance, it was a police report where, uh, and this was not my mistake, but it was a mistake in our newsroom where somebody has one of misread. five reporters. We're not, we, we all agree a mistake was made, but we won't say which. <laughs> well, no, I get naked. I just don't, I mean, nobody gives a brass ass, but like, uh, uh, <laughs> So it was a an arrest report, or sorry, a, a crime report of uh-huh. the then the quarterback of the the football team, and the initial reporter, uh, because we had to go down to the cops report uh, place and copy down the information. You didn't get physical copies of it. Mm-hmm. Had just written down the wrong number. He had added a zero, and at that point, this is pre name and likeness uh, deals that would have had ramifications for the NCAA because. If he has a hundred thousand dollars in his car, then it's a lot different than him saying that he had ten dollars in his car. Uh, yeah. It ran a certain way and then immediately fell apart. But the 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 initial thought was, oh my god, we now have a much larger story. And 
there was a lack of due diligence yeah. that 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 went there and it, it really kind of built this callus that i still have today where anything that makes me happy i immediately distrust i'm i, yeah. I am i, I am immediately a, uh, uh suspicious of i have a friend that <laughs> used the phrase because remember we were talking about like a do a presentation in front of a classroom somebody asked about perry reese's map this alleged map that was like pre-columbus sort of describing america and, and he says i'm suspicious because i want it to be true yes yeah yeah and that that's really a great mindset to have and there it, it's one that's trained in journalism and and science right the science is where we're supposed to be particularly good at saying yeah you know that that just perfectly fits what i was expecting and that's when we should be suspicious i mean so here here's how i think one of the main sources of scientific error happens right if you let's say you run a study and the results come out exactly the way you expected them to right you're not going to bother double checking to make sure that your code perfectly assigned people to the placebo or the experiment group, right? You're not going to double check that. Right. Whereas if it came out exactly the opposite of what you expected, you're going to go in and see what might have gone wrong that led to that outcome. So you're going to catch errors when it came out wrong, but you're going to miss errors when it came out the way you wanted it to, right? And this has happened a lot, right? I mean, there's a very famous Excel error that resulted in, um, you know, pushing for ideas of austerity. Uh, financial austerity. It was just an error in the code. Oh, I, I, um, it's just I, I, a copy I, down error, but you didn't detect it because it was consistent with what the authors wanted to argue at that point. Uh, tell us more about that specific story because I, I was not familiar with it, but I bet, I bet uh, Justin, you may be familiar with this one. Um, I'll, let me, I'd have to check oh, back and make right. sure I get the names I, right. I, but I, can... I, I believe it was during the uh, Obama yeah, yeah, administration. Yeah. There was uh, 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 a, a powerful conclusion of, of yeah. economic it's, policy that needed to be implemented immediately because it was severe and important. I mean, it was it was more it was a it was an Excel error and it was a fill down error in Excel and it was a and it made that led to a book by uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff, two very prominent economists, um, which led to the conclusion that too much national debt uh, undermines the growth of an economy. Right, so it was a, a used as an argument in favor of austerity. Right. But and, it was and, a and, fill down error in Excel. It was like taking this row and filling it down, and then end up duplicating some information with an equation. And, and was this that sort like of error happens all the time? Magnitude right? error, or it, it was it just led to the wrong conclusion, right? It, it, if you fix that error, it doesn't have the same outcome, right? Yeah. And th this is actually a pretty common sort of mistake, right? That you know if you can find errors in Excel spreadsheets that indicate that something was seriously wrong, and there was nothing malicious there. It was just a mistake. Right. Yeah. I mean, no, nobody was trying to fake anything. It literally was just, hey, we copied down an equation incorrectly. So it sounds like part of your uh, area of focus in the book is not only how we can fool other people, but also how we fool ourselves. I, is that yeah. the Absolutely. kind of root of things? Yeah, I mean, it, it's the same. It's the same sort of ideas, right? So these are cases where nobody was deliberately trying to deceive anybody else. There was no con. There was no scam. Uh, but it led to false information influencing policy, right? And the reason was it was a mistake because the people doing the research fooled themselves, right? And they didn't check as much because it fit their prediction. So yeah, I mean, if you think about social media sharing, right? You get you get a uh, a post that says, you know, um, all all seven Supreme Court justices tried to deny this, said that this person was not capable of being on the court. Yeah, and it's like that. That never happens, right? But if you believe that that person should not be on the court, it's the sort of thing that feeds into that narrative, and you might share it, thinking, "Oh, that's just that's really you know that's scary. This should never have happened. I'm going to pass that along to all of my friends," and not realizing that it's fake news. So uh, fake news that, works that, by by deceiving us, right? Yeah. And that's and that's the challenge. Is like, how do we? This is what we worked with in critical thinking, critical thinking education for years. Was mm -hmm. that, and I would yeah. see that. My peers, me, and I know I was guilty of this, was things that we, we conformed to our belief. We repeated things that didn't because mm -hmm. there was a higher reward of saying yep. the thing that we already thought was true. How do we overcome that? It, it's a real challenge. I mean, I think the, the simple step for, for things like social media is just before you share anything, just ask yourself, is that really true? Right? And what information would I need to check if it were? Right. And just asking that one more question, just for a moment, just remaining uncertain, just a tiny bit longer before you share something publicly can make a huge difference for spread of social disinformation and misinformation. Right. It's it's very but tempting big, to just kind of big, click retweet, you know. Yeah. But the big exploit there is our our trust of expertise. Like I trust my experts, you trust yep. yours. And if so and so, like 
the amount of stuff that comes out of my mouth that I don't know that I, that, that I will repeat that somebody else told me that I trusted is huge. And I, and I thought mm-hmm. like, I try to think about that more like, man, I said this, like, well, I no, somebody said this to me in a conversation and it registered. Yeah. I, I don't think I'd ever say anything if I didn't do that. It's, it's really hard. I mean, it's, you know, that, that's the real challenge, right? We, we, if you can verify that something has been, you know, actual experts have actually shown that this is consistent or that everybody is kind of in agreement on something first, almost never going to find everybody's always, you know, you're never going to find cases where everybody is in agreement, right? There always are going to be some outcasts out there who are making the opposite argument, even for things that, you know, are, are as established as, you know, the theory of evolution, right? You're going to find people who disagree with it. You're going to find people who think that the world is 6,000 years old, that you're going to run into those folks. And if they tout themselves as experts, you're going to run into problems, right? I, um, I, I wonder how much of it is um, uh, uh, structurally and alignment based. Uh, for example, retweeting an interesting thing that happens to align with a thing you would like more people to think about isn't necessarily saying, like, uh, for example, if they, in order to retweet, you would have to have a checkbox that said, uh, are you retweeting this because you think it's true or false? Then that might stop my hand from hitting mm-hmm. the retweet button or whatever. Yeah. How, how much of it is external uh, versus internal in, in terms of uh, trying to create a, an environment where we're all telling the yeah. truth more? I mean, one of the real challenges is that, you know, we have to trust other people, right? We, we, you can't get by in society without being at least somewhat trusting. And we tend to have what, what we call a truth bias. And this is a, a concept that's from philosophy and psychology. It goes back a long way. The idea that when we first hear something, we tend to accept it as true. And it takes effort and time and, and resources to counter it, to say, okay, maybe I shouldn't believe that. But if you're under time pressure or under you know, under stress, we tend not to take that step and question it more. So uh, because of that, building in sort of preventative checks that remind people, hey, are you sure you want to tweet this before you read it? Um, It's not a terrible idea, right? Uh, Anything you can do that makes it so that you don't have to distrust everybody around you, but you can have preventative measures that kind of do that automatically for you a little bit is really helpful. So uh, at the example that we use in, in the book, and it's a famous example is from the the band Van Halen, who famously in their concert writer said the the green room has to have a bowl of M&Ms, but with no brown ones, right? And, and it's not that they don't like brown M&Ms. I mean, they all taste the same. Um, it was just one thing that they put in there as a detail, and it's what we call a positive control. It was a check to make sure that people are actually paying attention. So if they come into the dressing room and they find that there are brown M&Ms in the bowl, they know that whoever was reading their concert writer and their instructions wasn't paying very close attention. And that's a worry when you get to the rigging and pyrotechnics in their show, which could kill somebody. So that was a way just as a quick check to say, okay, if there are brown M&Ms there, we're going to check more closely. If there were no brown M&Ms, that's no guarantee, but it at least gives you a little less concern that you know that people are paying attention to the details in what they do. So, so there's kind of two conflicting impulses. Uh, uh, on the one hand, we don't want to trust th- what we expect to see. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I, 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 how does one live his life and never get fooled? Asks the you, host you, of... Yeah. <laughs> you so, don't? <laughs> no, no, you don't understand. It's never no. fooled. Yeah, this, is fooled. Brian's, this is Brian's <laughs> eternal quest to yeah. never be fooled. So this man you know. will see any kind of event, a world event that's happening, and he will immediately go to why this is viral marketing and why like, this has all been put together by some unseen uh, uh, hand. He has never been fooled. Uh, he will never be fooled <laughs> he knows because... That. He is yeah. he is he is there to find all of the hidden meaning. So yeah. uh, uh, would you like to congratulate him? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think it's actually a really interesting question, and it's related to the, the gorilla video that we started with. Right. A lot of people will tell me, OK, what can I do to always see the gorilla? And my answer to that is you absolutely wouldn't want to, because the vast majority of time when something is happening outside of your focus of attention, you want to be able to ignore it, to filter it out. You don't want to be distracted by every object that goes by, every sound you hear. You'll never be able to get anything done because we have to be able to focus. We have a limited capacity to pay attention. 
And if you were perpetually distracted, you could never do that, right? So you wouldn't want to, given a, given a limited amount of attention, you wouldn't want to always notice everything. The consequence of that is sometimes you don't notice something that you would want to see. And I think the same is absolutely, it's absolutely the same way in terms of being deceived, right? Could you be a perma-skeptic questioning everything that you ever encounter at every moment? Not and be functional in society, right? And if <laughs> yeah, you if yeah. you go to the grocery you, store you, you can and be you, that the box, or wealthy, yeah. <laughs> pick one. Well, but even then, you know, there, there's limits to what you can do, right? So if you go into a grocery store and a box says that, or or the fruit says it's organic. Are you going to go out to the farm and make sure that they didn't use any chemicals? Are you going to monitor them indefinitely to make sure that they didn't just sneak in a little Roundup, right? That's not something you can do. You have to take their word for it. You have to be a little bit trusting. Yeah. Are you going to check every item on your receipt against the price that was on the shelf and double check to make sure that you weren't off by a penny? Yeah. No, you, probably not. You know, what's interesting is uh, the, uh, what springs to mind immediately is um, a counter example is uh, I have a couple of daughters who have anaphylactic uh, food allergies and mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, they can't just say no peanuts or no eggs. Yep. Uh, and and so we're like, yeah, sure, 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 sure. They have to do that level of examination. Yep. Um, and yeah. I wonder if, uh, if, if I so I I, I I don't know how what I'm allowed to say, yeah. but um, it would be interesting if an AI bot was able to look at a food label and know things that aren't labeled as allergens, but be able to intuit uh, when my 19 year old was a baby uh tocopherols are a way to get vitamin e and they're often derived from soy but they're they've done so in such a way that that they don't have to label it as warning contains soy uh but meanwhile she would you know have terrible reactions um yeah. uh I, I i wonder how much ai will help us to be as skeptical as it sounds like we should be of things that we expect to see uh, in in the future. I mean, you know, that's it's a really interesting question, right? Partly that depends on the label being accurate in the first place, right? So if, if you have the information going in, it's if you don't have the right information going into the model, you're not going to get the right information out, right? So that's going to be the challenge that if the if the label itself is deceptive, right, and that's a common problem, right? For people with allergies, you go into a restaurant and they say, oh yeah, yeah, we don't use any peanut oil. Um, but they don't necessarily know whether or not peanut oil is in any of the products that they buy from someplace else. And they probably yeah. aren't as conscientious about checking it. But I think that's a perfect example of when not to trust, right? Because the consequences are huge there. Uh, the consequences it, of paying a few extra cents at the grocery store are tiny. The it, consequences of shock are bad. Well, and, and, and it's very, very, if, if, if nobody wants to be the parent that that infuses in their children uh no the whole world is trying to kill you at all times like whether they mean to yeah. or not or whatever that's 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 an uncomfortable lesson yeah. to to teach um what what uh, what what is the one thing that you think uh one habit everybody could adopt um i guess doubting everything um, <laughs> that, that, that you think would be most productive in making sure that you don't fall for somebody else's scam. You know, I, I think the really, th there are two elements to that, right? One is when does it matter? Right. So, and that, that's the, the example of, you know, allergies, it matters there, right? If you're being deceived, if you're investing your life savings with somebody, it matters there, right? There, there are consequences to that. Um, if you are buying something really expensive, you're buying some really expensive art, it matters there whether it might be forged. And when you think about when it matters, those are the times when somebody who's looking to deceive you is going to go to a tremendous amount of trouble to make it seem plausible, right? So- uh, 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 Speaking of which, uh, art deception is, is yeah. a world in which it's not just the art itself, but um, uh, it's, a, is it provenance? Is that what you call it? But basically- Pro Provenance, yep. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. the, the historical record of, of yeah. this person had it and then the next person had it. Uh, if you don't mind sharing yeah, one yeah. of the stories from the books, I, I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. oh, I mean, there, there are lots of amazing cases of this, but one thing to think about when you're thinking about selling art, especially you know fine art, it's there's a lot of money involved, right? If, if something's worth millions of dollars, it's worth it to a con artist who's trying to pass off a forgery to go to huge lengths because they might take two years or three years to set up a con because the payout's so big. 
right? All they need is one sale and they've made their money back. Um, so there are, are art fraudsters and dealers who have gone to the lengths of inserting fake provenance, fake history for a painting, fake showings and exhibitions into the archives that people would check if they're trying to be careful and make sure that it's right. Um, there are people who, you know, the, the Nodler Gallery that went under relatively recently is a really interesting case because, you know, they were passing off lots of mid-century modern, uh, you know, mid-century, you know, um, artwork, Rothko's and Pollock's and things like that, um, that were fake, right? And the question was, how do they do it? Well, one of the things that often happened was they'd be shown to a bunch of people who said, oh yeah, that's a very nice painting, right? You know, they'd show it to the kid of Rothko. It's, oh yeah, you know, that, that looks really nice, but didn't say anything about the, the actual, you know, provenance of the painting didn't say for sure that it was theirs. And it's a challenge because first it's a, it's an industry that is largely unregulated, right? And any largely unregulated industry is with a lot of money involved is ripe for fraud. Um, there are some estimates that like half the paintings hanging in major art museums are forgeries, right? It's really hard to know exactly what the history is. And for a lot of these paintings, unless you can trace it from the origin to modern day, you have no idea whether somebody inserted something in the middle of that history. And it's it's a real big challenge and there's a lot of money involved. So that's a that's a case where, you know, yeah, you're at risk. I'm okay with that though, because it's not like you hear like, ah, oh, I'm a single mom and I wasted my money on the Salvatore Monday. No, that didn't yeah. happen. That's never happened. It, it's, yeah. it's, you look yeah. at like Salvatore Monday is a case of like half billion dollar. This thing's, I'm going to say things a fake, this thing, everything yeah. about it reeked a fake and whatnot. And, oh, this lost Leonardo. And yeah. it's just, it's such a symptom of that industry of like, you know, wishful thinking yeah. among people. Oh, you know what? So much I, actually, I, I can picture a version where it would affect um, uh, 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 the not hyper elites. Um, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, they sponsored a video. The uh, Remus's birthday. The, uh, what's what's the invest in a uh, piece of art? Uh, masterworks. Uh, yeah, don't masterworks. Do yeah, don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. Don't yeah. do it. Any, don't do it. Anybody selling fine art on a cruise ship probably don't want to buy it. Um, that's yeah. not where you would get fine art. Anything that's anything that's being advertised as a you know art classic, it, they're not going to advertise those, right? Those are going yeah. to auction houses. So you know, there's lots of scams out there that are you know. But you're you're right that the, the consequences in those cases are mostly for very very wealthy people who probably can afford it, right? So it's not it's not the sort of vicious. Uh, scams that are taking advantage of people's fears and putting them on the on the line for what little money they have. You know, they're, they're scams that target people who are immigrants um, and threaten them with deportation or going to jail if they don't immediately go buy cash cards and read the numbers over the phone. Yeah. This is a, a call center scam. That's horrific. There, Did we get there's uh, you know. And we have versions that too, like the, the one of the things I think when you think about the chain of trust is what are the incentives for the person I'm trusting? You've seen this with uh, uh, state budget things like this. They bring in experts from financial firms who recommend a deal, and really their goal is to get the deal flow. It's like most mutual mm -hmm. funds are dumb. Most do you know, like do an index fund. Anything else is just bad. Mm -hmm. But we people continue. I got this mutual fund. The advisor sold me like snake oil. They know the data. They know that's not going to work. And it's weird because we it's legal and it, and it's we don't put that in the same category as another kind of scam. But when they know only know yeah. the likelihood that this is going to perform isn't there, it seems. Well, it, it comes back to incentives a lot of the times. I mean, you think about buying real estate, right? Your, your real estate agent is not necessarily looking to get the highest price when you sell your house. They're looking to sell the house because the difference between a difference of an additional $5,000 is huge to you. But to them, it's a tiny fraction of that and getting getting the bulk of their reward right away is big, right? So there yeah, often are incentives that are, yeah, I mean, this has been a topic that's been covered quite a bit, of course, but thinking about yeah, what somebody else's just, incentives are is huge. Yeah, realtors will keep their house on the market when they sell their own house, will keep on the market longer than they will their clients. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that, that, that sort of incentive structure, you have to think about the, from the perspective of somebody who might be doing a scam, especially when there's big money involved, what would they do? What's what's their incentive? And their incentive is to, to lock you in. And what are they going to do to do that? They're going to apply every technique of persuasion they can um, to make it convincing. Uh, Daniel, there's um, you know a, a current conversation that is happening uh, a, a lot, not only in news but in my industry of covering politics specifically about misinformation and and disinformation. And you and you made mm -hmm. mention of that in terms of 
uh, spreading various things on Twitter. But it's always been something that's made me very uncomfortable because especially in the world of politics, which is in many ways the art of information right. warfare, the, the concept of immediately labeling something as, you know, a harmful or, or, or something that is worthy of policing, uh, uh, I think, especially with the hair trigger and when we don't really know who the quote unquote experts are that are determining X, Y, and Z is always kind of sent chills down my spine mm -hmm. because a lot of the incentives that you've, that you've outlaid uh, can be really, really perverted if we are policing truth or information yeah. like that. Uh, how do you think that the findings in, in your book uh, uh, relate to that conversation? You know, it's interesting. We, we actually deliberately did not focus on uh, disinformation, propaganda, misinformation, um, because our focus was much more on how how this direct deception takes advantages of our of our habits and the kinds of information we find appealing. And those sorts of issues are equal opportunity, right? Yeah. Regardless of what sort of political perspective you have, we're all subject to those same sorts of cognitive habits, and they tend to be pervasive across all of the different sorts of cons and scams. So we, and there have been a lot of books on misinformation, disinformation, how to correct it, how to kind of hedge it, um, and we deliberately sidestepped it. Yeah, um, we, we talk about it a little bit in the context of easily sharing something that you predicted and expected, um, but we we deliberately didn't want to talk about how to solve that problem because it's it's a really thorny problem and it was a little bit tangential to our our main focus. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. uh, from my perspective. I don't know if you can, <laughs> or at least I I, I, I don't it's know a tough if problem. you. I don't know if you can by by creating a a, a gang yeah. of a, a, a truth commission people, uh, or at least yeah. let, let, let's say that everybody has the best intentions and everybody is is doing mm -hmm. the best job that they possibly can. You're still going to run into a lot of the same problems that you that you've laid out in some yep. of the uh, uh, you know scientific studies. Yeah, well, absolutely, and, and you know, I, I've I've seen people say, uh, "Well, I'm a I'm a contrarian, I'm a skeptical thinker, I'm a critical thinker, so I don't fall for deception." Yeah, and it's like, yeah, I mean, as you know, Brian and others will tell you, it's like, you know, people who think that they're critical thinkers and are going to figure everything out are pretty easy to fool, right? Because <laughs> once you give them a single false lead, they've bought it. And they're not going to let go of it until it's too late to figure out what actually happened. It, right? it, it, we, we've talked about this on other programs uh, and this one, where the more certain somebody is that they won't be fooled, says the guy who doesn't. Who's want to be never fooled. been fooled. <laughs> not once. <laughs> they, they, it seems like they, they, they are brittle <laughs> enough that they become the easiest targets. There's so, a... Yeah. We would, when we would, you know, working in the million dollar challenge and you'd counter somebody go, how sure are you? When I'd hear hundred percent, that's when my yeah. flags go off. Like I'm, I'm, You've got I, 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 I think I'm a good observer. I'm a magician. I'm trained. I get fooled all the time. And so when somebody yeah. tells me like, oh, I'm not, I'm like, all right, you're not very good at self-evaluation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, people who are, view themselves as skeptical thinkers, it's true that some people are going to be more skeptical. Others are maybe going to be more gullible. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't be targeted, right? And if you feed somebody something that perfectly fits their skepticism, they're going to jump right on it. And the number of times I've seen people kind of who, who view themselves as skeptical sharing something that also was skeptical and being and was wrong, it's, it's all the time, right? We all fall for that same sort of thing. If it fits what our narrative is, we're more likely to share it without saying, hey, is that really true? Do I really believe that? Or should I really believe that? And the nice thing about, you know, the equal opportunity nature of this sort of misinformation and disinformation is that everybody should be asking themselves that question. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Have, have yeah, you noticed you, 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 you should always do it. You know, and that's, sorry to cut you off, Brian, but you know, something that we with World's Greatest Con have taken a very, very deliberate long look at is the disconnection of the popular idea that, well, if you are smart, that means that you are going to fall for these things less or if you yeah. are, are dumb however we want to categorize yeah. these things that 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 is the barometer when it's something i think for us we very much think like no it, this is entirely disconnected there are hardware elements to our brain which are exploitable and yeah. uh, uh, how fast your processor is 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 largely disconnected from it if not yeah. even maybe going the other way that the smarter you are the faster you think the more you might latch onto things that that you know, might leave you vulnerable. 
Yeah, I mean, it totally depends on the nature of the scam, right? So people who are well-educated, smart, are probably less likely to fall for an email from somebody claiming to be a Nigerian prince with vast fortunes to be found, right? Yes. Um, they're probably not going to fall for that scam. But they could easily fall for something else, right? And uh, that, that's one of the central themes that we use as well, right? It, that, you know, it's not just gullible people who fall for this. It's people at the top of their professions, people who are, you know, brilliant in many ways. If you hit them in the right way, and uh, then you can fool them. In, in your research, is there anything to the idea, uh, I, I bumped up across it a few times, the idea that Nigerian Prince uh, 419 uh, email scams mm -hmm. are intentionally written poorly uh, so as to, like, like, is there data to back up the idea that they're written poorly so that they lure in the most gullible? There's there's not really data for it because it's not, how would you get that those data but it's um it's a reasonable argument to make that the goal of the nigerian email scam sending out these massive emails that are just nonsensical or have a lot of gibberish in them is to work as a filter right so it's really costly for somebody who's doing this sort of a scam to spend a lot of time interacting with one person to try and get them to send their money it takes a while that's not just like they're not just going to instantly send it you have to actually engage and that engagement process is costly, right. but so, so, so sending we're, out we're, emails we're back is to not. Alignments at, at this point. Yep. Uh, incentives. Yeah. Right. So if you can filter. Um, oh, oh, sorry. We lost it, Andrew's. It looks like Andrew's uh, muted right now. Uh, still muted. Nope, still muted. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's that. That's a big issue, right? That the selection process can be very effective. You want to target the people you're trying to reach. And if you can send out millions of emails to get a tiny percentage of them who are actually willing to send their money and the people who would never send their money, but who would just bait the scammers by keeping them busy, they're for the most part, just gonna I, you know, drop the email and delete it. Yep. I don't accept that hypothesis at all. I, I, not yours, but in the picture, the, the one that it's intentionally the fool, because one, otherwise, you know, newspapers written for people below a certain income level or gullible would be written poorly that way. From a technical point of view as a developer, it's how to get past, it's how you get past the filters. Because mm -hmm. once you figure out the phrases that are in a scam email, you put in a phrase for that filter. So what you do is you start to slowly, you degrade what happens over time. You outwardly end up degrading the email message because you say, okay, I can insert this A or whatever like this, because that's always... That's always yeah, been yeah. sort of me is the consistent explanation was it's to get around the spam filters. And it's an element of that, right? You know, getting them around, but they're not doing it very well if that's their goal, right? The spam filters well, are pretty good at catching the Nigerian email uh, sorts of stuff now. So I, I, you know, I find, I find 10 of those a day still in my email uh, oh, no, in the spam I, filter. Yeah. No, I agree, but I'm saying that was because you'd see, because that that's the way, for, from a technical point of view, literally the way spam filters worked is you look for those phrases. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. when you started to see the substitution of different characters and different stuff mm -hmm. and changing the grammar and whatnot, because as spam yeah, filters yeah. came in theory more sophisticated, but then people use white label accounts and other stuff too. So, well, and uh, yeah. uh, what's interesting is it leads to, uh, I, I think, not, not bad. I, I don't think I'm being malicious uh, uh, when, uh, uh, when I send out an email. Uh, sometimes I'll notice that I mistyped the word the T H E and spelled it T E H and I'll say, yep, nope, I'll, I'm going to leave that. Uh, that way they'll know for sure. <laughs> Brian Brushwood was definitely the person writing. There's us. only one I, thing I, that's I, absolutely for sure. And all you losers are best friends with the prince like I am. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll say a thing to the thing that bothered me. And again, I could be wrong. The thing that bothered me about it's intentionally misspelled is to attract a certain kind of people. It's a latest approach. I know very high level, edu highly educated people who fall for those scams. And when we say, yeah. oh, it's only the dumbs are going to fall for it because they spell it for the no, dumbs, no, like that just. It's not, no, it's not, it's not that it's people who are dumb, right? It's that people who are receptive to the, uh, to the possibility, right? So people well, who find it, po and there are smart people who have fallen for the equivalent of Nigerian email scams, right? Um, you know, the New Yorker did a profile of, of a psychiatrist who fell for it, right? So somebody's yeah. got an MD, right? No, so it's not, it's not a matter of being smart or dumb. Yeah. No, I got, I got my point was about the idea that they were intentionally degrading the language or whatever there, oh, because, because that, I that argument was out there. But, you know, it still, it still has an advantage, right? That people who are going to look at that and say, okay, I shouldn't trust this because it's grammatically nonsense are going to not respond to it. Right. So those are people who are going to be, it's filtering out, effectively filtering out some people who are skeptical, whether or not it's was originally to bypass spam filters, 
you know, it got through spam filters for a long time with grammar mistakes in it in the early days. That, that scam has been around since before email, right? So it originally was letters, um, which was much more cost inefficient for yeah. the scammers. It's really expensive. So they didn't have to, they, they had to figure out ways of selecting people to respond under those conditions. But it's also the case that they couldn't afford to send it out as much, right? The, it was just too much of a problem. The The book opens with a, a, a brief summary of, uh, was it Theranos? Um, uh, uh, how 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 did you read that New York Times article? Uh, call call her Liz after because uh, I assume that the book was written at this point and to see a very sympathetic uh, uh, New York Times yeah. article about Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, how 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 did that land with you? It it struck me as whitewashing a bit, um, and John Kerry Rue I think made the same point on his. Uh, the bad blood podcast where he was talking about it after the fact and leading up to the trial was, you know, quite frustrated because everybody who knew everybody who had talked about that case, everybody who knew that case said, in fact, he had predicted earlier, um, had said things like she might be having kids in order to look more sympathetic, right. For the, for the sentencing. Now, I don't, I don't know her. I don't know anything about her, but that's a number of people were saying that, you know, this is a reputation whitewashing case. Right, that this is not somebody who is touchy feely in that way. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, you know, I, I don't know. It's not. I don't know any of these people personally, obviously. On the on the origins of that, it's also kind of when you talk about expertise, like uh, being in tech and being in the West Coast, and then hearing you. I have friends or investors and stuff, and you're like, most of the West Coast investors never went near Theranos because they looked at it yeah. and they said, "This is a technical thing. This is BS." There's a there's a phrase where East Coast is the dumb money and, and the idea that like you look to see who gets funded. Like I have a friend in New York who got asked to finance a Broadway, an off Broadway play, and he said, What do you think? I said, The fact that you're asking you should tell you to say no because it means all the smart money said no. And you see that a lot <laughs> in tech with some of these big tech yeah. things, you'll be like, Oh, they raised a you go like like tech things, like there was a big thing I can't get into. Like a company raised a ton of money. People are like, What do you think? I'm like, it was East Coast money, and that company then failed. It's like East yeah. Coast, if it's some financial thing or something like that, they're going to know. If it's some tech thing, it's going to be the West Coast. So there is a thing like smell where yeah. – which experts do you listen to? Not just, oh, they invest money, but do they even know this branch? Do they even know this industry? Yeah, and you get to know the people in that industry, and you know who the who the hucksters are and who aren't. And, you know, yeah, exactly. You get a better feel for what you should be paying attention to or not. Um you know, there's a lot of venture capital that should probably do better due diligence, right, of of those sorts of companies. Yeah, sure. Well, they get excited like everybody else is that yeah. they see yeah. money being made in an era. In, and they, they want to be the first in, right? Yeah. Or, or don't, they don't want to be the last in. And, and they'll right. see that, you know, and that's I've seen that recently with just watching where money has been going. Like, they can't get into this deal. We'll go to the second best deal. Like, I won't decide that it's yeah. the second. It's, it's as good as the first one. And it's Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know what? I, I just got what appears to be a, an urgent phone call. <laughs> so uh, let, let's make sure that we do the important part, which is uh, remind everybody uh, that uh, uh, Dan Simons' new book, along with uh, 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 Chris, is uh, Nobody's Fool, Why We Get Taken In and What We Can Do About It. Uh, what is the best way to be yeah. helpful for you? Give us uh, specific instructions. Yes. And I may be skeptical of it because I won't be fooled. <laughs> Will be the best way to be helpful. Tell a friend, tell a couple of friends, buy books for a couple of friends. That'd be great. Is there is there any Write specific place that you would like for our audience to buy it? I know that especially with books, yeah. uh, it, it helps to uh, to concentrate firepower in one place or another. It can, um, you know. I think if you if you like buying from places like Amazon and Barnes and Noble, that's that's fine. If you don't, there's uh, the company Bookshop is a really cool new. Uh, um, nonprofit organization that consolidates small, uh, small local bookstores all over the country. So if you buy it from there, you order it online and you can designate where the proceeds go. They can go to your local bookstore. Um, it's a really neat, you know, neat idea as a way of sort of helping people to buy local. So if you want to buy, buy local, go to bookshop, um, you know, .org and you could do it that way. If you want to buy, you know, from the big vendors and get it very, very quickly, you know, Amazon and Barnes and Noble are the, are the big games. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to say, as an author, everybody listening, I'm going to tell you the quiet part out loud. Read it. If you like it, tell everybody what you liked about it. Review it. Reviews. Yep. Buy the book. Review it. It moves books. Your word of mouth is yep. absolutely great. But, man, get on Amazon. 
and say something nice, tell people something about what you liked about it, because it also it helps other readers to go, oh, is this for yeah. me? And so please, 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 please go out there, read it, review it. Yeah, yeah. reviews make a big difference. And you know, if, if you like the book, please leave a review. If, if you hate the book, you can always just you know DM me with curse words and that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I always phrase it. Like if you read it and you yeah. really like it, share what you liked about it on a review. Yeah. If you don't, yeah. eh, here's my personal phone phone. number. Yep. <laughs> I, would, I, would prefer, I would prefer you <laughs> yell at me in person <laughs> than you leave a one star review. Okay. Wait, here. But I, I, I'm I, an, I, I, I have to duck okay, out. Go. Uh, go. But, but my, yes. pick, my pick is nobody's fool. Yes. Uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, 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 Dan, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much for joining. Absolutely. Us. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Andrew, you want to take us out? It's been very educational and weird. Hey, hey, good show, everybody. Dan, thank you so much. That was awesome. Yeah, absolutely. That was fun. Um, yeah, I hope we get more chances to chat. It's kind of a you know, different format that I'm used to. Oh, dude, totally. <laughs> yeah. How, how is how is the book uh, the book blitz been been going? How long you been cranking on it? It's been nonstop. So yeah, we started we started recording podcasts back in April. Um, wow. And wow. it's been pretty much a go since then Dude, so, yeah that's, you all are putting um, out a podcast series to promote it as well is that no we're not uh it? you know it, it's uh we we probably should have started doing that two years ago if we wanted to but you know we were still writing so oh it's always um, it's always a good time though i mean for whatever yeah. like i i hope yeah i've known michael Shermer since the mid 90s and i've watched mm -hmm. him just build up his over of books and whatnot uh -huh. and i hope you yeah. continue to do this and keep just keep writing yeah. on this and talking about it because it's yeah no, yeah we're doing his show next week I think so um, oh yeah yeah I have a funny yeah. when he showed the the gorilla video at the the amazing meeting way back like two thousand three two thousand six or something mm -hmm. like that you know you talk about like different parts of the brain like the Holly Berry neuron we have different mm -hmm. we focus on stuff yeah. there's, there's good evidence to show that there's you know you know folk not uh, okay yeah. go speak yeah, yeah. No, there's no, plenty of evidence that we focus yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but the idea is that neurons are wire, fire together, wire together, and we do have a t neurons sure. as far as you're the expert mm -hmm. on attention. You're expert. I'm not going to mm -hmm. say that, but like, yep. I love monkeys. I love monkeys. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm obsessed with this man. So it, Michael, it's not, not not a joke. Not a yeah. joke. This so man Michael loves played the video, and I got very distracted by the gorilla walking across. I started laughing because <laughs> there's a, there's a gorilla, and I'm laughing at this gorilla, and I look around, and I'm like. I know the problem with my attention span is I think too much about my <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's, it's interesting that, that that's actually a, an empirical question that we're studying right now. Does things that we're familiar with, right, and really interested in or know about, uh, do they kind of break through more? And, yeah. you know, one of the interesting findings, so if, you, if you're constantly attuned to monkeys or you're really familiar with monkeys, will, will a person in a gorilla suit pop out more? And at least under more controlled studies. I mean, the gorilla video is not a controlled study. That, that's mm -hmm. that's a demo level sort of study. Mm -hmm. But when we've been doing it under controlled conditions, it turns out we don't find the effect. Um, so here, here's a study I, I, that we I, did. I, no, I, yeah, please yeah. go ahead. I believe you, so I imagine, believe you on that. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a study where we, um, we tested participants in two different countries, and we either showed the, the standard sort of petrol gasoline station logo. So in some countries, there's only one gas station, right? It's, it's all owned by one company or one or by the government. So we showed them the, the logo from their own country or the logo from the other country. And then we swapped across the populations and there was no difference at all in noticing. Same thing for the national flags. Um, you weren't any more likely to notice your own flag as a flag that you didn't know. Um, yeah, which well, to me is shocking. Logos, but so. But also, like people can't draw mm -hmm. logos if you ask. Well, they can't. They, they draw. can't draw them, but you can recognize them really, really yeah. well. Right. Yeah. So, and this this was just a detection, right? It wasn't no, asking you to I, recreate I, it. Yeah. Yeah, I think because it's our focus windows there, and I think that mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I believe that it's like yeah. the stuff where, uh, yeah. chess masters are great at remembering the position of a board as long as it's a mm -hmm. legal position. The moment it's not a legal yep. position, don't. Yeah. It. We actually have a video on my YouTube channel of a grandmaster doing that task. Right, where we show him chess positions mm. and have him recreate them, and then we show him random ones, and he's like really frustrated. Um, it's really great. Oh, wow. um, yeah, it's fun. It, it, you should check it out because it's fun to watch him talk about it too. He's, he's really yeah. interesting. Um, it's disturbing yeah. to realize your expertise is undermined by some simple algorithm. It's you know yeah. Well, I mean, it, your expertise is based on this you know the thing that you've memorized. Yeah, here here's the video. Yeah, um, is Patrick Wolf, who was a former U.S. champion. Um, it's a high level player. Um, I think now he's in the financial industry, but, um, oh. mm -hmm. 
Wow. Yeah, this is setting up a random, you know, a random position. It's like he's got, you know, there were like 25 pieces on the position and that's all he could do. Um, mm -hmm. But when it's the, uh, when it's a regular position, he just, he nails it. And he'll, he'll say, you know, I don't know whether this rook is here or right next to here because it doesn't matter for the position, right? Um, mm. You know, I can, and then afterwards he went back over the, we ran him through like five of those positions. And then a half an hour later, he said, well, in that first position, and he sets it up again, <laughs> right? Having not seen it again and said, you know, all that mattered was this attack over here. Nothing else mattered. I, I could just ignore all the other stuff. And that's why I wasn't sure where this rook goes because who cares? It's, it's like, everything's over here. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, it's fun to watch. Yeah. That it's, is amazing. It's yeah. Because you get into like such like expertise level knowledge that yeah you the context matters right you say like oh well but you're missing all of these other things that are these small yeah. influences yeah wow. well and that's it that's exactly i mean in his, in his at that level of expertise he can look at this position and say okay this is a winning position because of what's going on over here which means he may be less likely to remember the position of some piece on the other side of the board that was irrelevant to the attack right mm -hmm. whereas somebody at my level kind of a you know average tournament player I would look at it and I probably wouldn't see the attack and I might be more likely to remember the position of that arbitrary work that didn't matter. Yeah. Right. Because I wasn't drawn to what did matter. Right. So, you know, there's some evidence that, you know, experienced surgeons are more likely to miss, you know, something that's completely out of the ordinary because they're looking for it, something in particular that, so if you, if they're going in and looking for a tumor, they might not notice something else. Right. Yeah. Um, because we... that's, they're able to find it really efficiently. We're, we're finding interesting research as far as like how well AI can like diagnose disease and comparing them to mm -hmm. like doctors as baselines. And, yeah. it, and it, you know, and it, and it, right now on average, you're better to have an AI do your diagnosis. Well, <laughs> their exceptions are because a person who understands some very particular area of oncology, whatever, mm -hmm. they're going to pick up a thing in AI word. And it's that weird, right. <clears throat> we're in a very weird yeah, place a, right now with expertise. It's the Dr. House. Absolutely. Paradox. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the Dr. House thing is like, yeah, I've actually, for our last book, I interviewed some diagnosticians. Um, and what's interesting about that, that, that show was kind of cool in a lot of ways, um, but it was completely unrealistic because when somebody's being a diagnostician, they would never see somebody in the ER ever, right? They're never going to be brought in to diagnose this weird case in the ER. The diagnosticians see them after three years of going to every doctor around to try and figure out what's going on. Right. And they'll only see them with years of medical records. And what they'll, they say, you know, if you talk to these people who actually do this, right, who will find the one case of plague or the, the sorts of things that are on house all the time are extraordinarily rare. And these people might see it once or twice in their career of 40 years. Yeah. But because they're in that role of a diagnostician, right, they don't have to rule out the obvious stuff. Right. They're not looking for it because other people have already ruled out all of the really obvious stuff. Mm. So they they can come in with this mindset of, okay, I'm looking for a weird thing that holds all of this stuff together. And what they say is like, you know, if I'm lucky, we hit 50%. You know, we, we figure it out 50% of the time. Yeah. And Hugh Laurie's accent time, no sucked. <laughs> it was fine. It was fine. I <laughs> think I, I'm an American. I yeah. He also I doesn't have a limp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah my, my cousin teaches him tennis. So. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Oh, He's sorry. a very nice I guy. I love you, Laurie. Yeah. He's great. He's a yeah. good guy. Yeah. Um, no, Justin, but go on about his accent. His yeah, accent Come I'm, on. Hey, I'm just an <laughs> all American guy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the 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 trick is if you're British, uh, 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 harden your R's. Make sure yeah. to say your yeah. R's. Well, it's also this like kind of like me, like, like uh, it sounds like, like it's like, like, like a Chicago. Yeah, gangsters. see, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's <laughs> lupus. <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite experiences was I, I did a semester in London in a theater program, just mostly attending theater, and they tried to do a Tennessee Williams play in London. <laughs> And oh. the accents were just like it was a weird mix of you know New Orleans oh, and oh, Boston oh, and Chicago. And, I would pay so much money. To <laughs> but but <laughs> you know then then Americans put on British accents and they like there is no British accent right. It's, it's oh, our regional is, dialect. Is, yeah, we do like yeah. Monty Python, Holy Grail. Like that's yeah. You know. The level. And even then, we're probably mangling you know Liverpool oh, versus God. London versus yeah. Edinburgh. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, there, there's uh, um, I, I'm, I'm not proud of this, but uh, one of my favorite things in the entire world was to go see magic competitions. Um, 
and I wish everyone the best in all magic competitions, but to see a performance that clearly was rehearsed a thousand times in a living room and for the very first time is being performed on a stage is an extraordinary <laughs> experience. <laughs> And send, suddenly cautiously. somebody has lights in their face and they can't. Uh, and then uh, <laughs> uh, strange anymore. things happen. They, they, they encounter, yeah. you know, like, you know, it turns out it takes five steps to get over to the thing or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's 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 that 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 chef's kiss, delightful wabi sabi <laughs> that uh, it's 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 the, yeah. The strange thing I ever saw. And I'm sorry for keeping here, Dan, but, you know, we're, we're, yeah, we're a, tired of our own fun. voices. Um, <laughs> I went to is an open mic night. And I watched a guy go up on stage. And I mean, he looked like, you know, he's probably 38. So looked like he lived with his mother and always will be until he like wears her clothes, or whatever. Just, just kind of an off kind of guy. <laughs> her as clothes, not wears her <laughs> and, clothes, but wears yeah. her as clothes. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He gets <laughs> up on stage and he starts to do like Richard Nixon. He starts to do like all of these 1970s impersonations and just starts like, oh, da, 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 da. I'm like, what, what's going on? And then I realized is this guy had memorized like a Richard, remember the, the person had Rich Little? He memorized yeah. the entire Rich Little oh, record. Wow. He memorized the album and he was going up there doing like a track from the album word for word. Wow. And, and, and the audience huh. is like, what's going on? Cause he just totally tuned out everybody. Just totally. <laughs> I'm like, this was, it was a very, very, it's kind of like I Robin Williams mean, doing Elmer Fudd doing Bruce Springsteen. Have you ever heard that? Oh, routine? that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that the track that? No, no, no. Is that the one that ends with fire? Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Rob Williams was interesting because like stories about him, he was noted as a notorious joke thief, and he may not oh, have yeah. known it. You know, the the yeah. one story talked about a comedian. She was also working as a taxi driver, and they're in some long Manhattan traffic. And she tells him a story at the beginning of the taxi drive, and by the end of it, he repeated it back to her as if it had happened to him. And, <laughs> and people, comedians, would get nervous if they saw Robert Williams in their audience. Like if he was in, in L.A. to go do the Tonight Show, and they saw him in the audience, and they're like, "He's going to take my job." Well, and 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 I I could totally believe that he would never do that with malice or the intent of stealing. It's just that. Yeah. Uh, First memory. Uh, 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 data goes in. Robin Williams' there, joke comes out. I, I could also imagine that he's a panicked stand-up comic who are not notoriously the most robust in terms of self-esteem, and he could just he could just kill to the level for which he got away with it. You know what? Because I, he I, can yeah, perform I, it in a way that is also, amazing. Because I've heard. I've heard that other, I've heard somebody else say, no, I watched him go on like for the Emmys or whatever. Like I watched him rehearse on stage and go to each beat, each point in the thing he was going to say there. And that, and then, then go on stage and make it look like, cause he was, he was an actor. He was a great actor. Yeah. He played that manic comedic guy very well. And some people say like, no, that was the actor playing yeah. the manic comedian, not the manic comedian who became an actor. Although in the '80s he was so coked up that it's hard to know, you know, how, how much of it was. We forgot because he was. So hey, look, I mean, the, that's that's the thing. Yeah. Dean Martin started out as a teetotaler, playing a drunk. Uh, he ended yeah. a drunk. <laughs> drunk. Yeah. And Williams went the other way around. <laughs> yeah. Right. He was. Yeah. He was. He was yeah, totally coked, coked up through like Mork and Mindy, and yeah. In fact, I believe that's where Nenu Nenu came from, is that it was supposed to be Nana Nunu, but he was too coked up. To, and he just said Nenu Nenu. And they're like, it's fine. Okay. Cut, yeah. print. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, also, I, I I just came in, uh, oh, well, and I, I see we're in after things. Uh, uh, well, we're just hanging out. No, we oh, okay. we're just right. hanging we're out. Just, you know, we'll just yeah. hang out. And we're just man, why don't we just hang out for a minute? Yeah, man. We're just hanging for That's the audience, for the people. <laughs> nanu, nanu, you man. need to go buy the book, everybody. So another, uh, go buy the yeah. book immediately. Okay. Don't so, be fooled. Buy the book. <laughs> Review the book. Say nice they, things they about are, the book. They are telling you to not buy the book. Oh. Do not be fooled by them. Stop them. Buy the book. Can I tell a totally unrelated story? Uh Man, I wrote such a good review for a book once. Uh -huh. it, oh my God. It, it involved yeah. a photograph of me laughing and and reading the book. Uh, it involved a, 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 
explicit explanation of who this book is for and who it's not for. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned specific things about my favorite parts of the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. I, I'm just really proud of the way I write very good five. Uh, doesn't matter how many stars there were. Yeah, uh, but they uh, should be five. It, it, but, 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 but it doesn't matter, I but it should be five. good <laughs> reviews yeah. for books is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. You are yeah. a prolific book review writer. Oh, my God. I'm the best. I've, uh, what about you? Uh, uh, do you feel good about writing reviews for books? Never done it. Uh, would you like to try? I, I'll, I'll bust. I'll bust one out. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I'm you'll, a, you'll do it when you bust finally it encounter a book worth reviewing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I started. You know, my life has been it. bereft of my friend, my friend's publishing, so I've <laughs> never had an opportunity to write a review for a book. <laughs> I, I did it until I remember telling people, admonishing my readers, if you get it, the best thing to do for a writer is to, if you read a book, is to say somebody like, and then I'm like, man, I say this a lot. Do I do it? And immediately after I did that podcast, I just started writing. It looked like the last five books, I started writing reviews. Good habit. Good Dracula habit to pick Brian. up. Dracula, oh, I, 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 I'm yeah, possibly our, as a vampire. Our, yeah. our, our, our light no, here that, on, that's on my the new studio thing. That's went what out. I do. Yeah, <laughs> it's on. It has to run on battery power because the the cable, the plug is broken. I, like, you oh. look like the, the part where we talked to the former mafia hit me. I was gonna <laughs> say, I was trying to find the place where I could just do like like. Oh, oh frat Tony told me to go get <laughs> take care of business. History. You're telling me I'm not getting paid. Yeah, hey guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to sign off. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Hey, Dan. Sorry, thank, thank you, Dan. you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for chatting. It was fun. Absolutely. Right. Congratulations on the book. Good, yep. sir. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Take care. Yeah. All right. It's just us here. Dan. Yeah. Dan. Are we live or just us? We're still live here. Oh, we're, we're, still just live. we're still live. We're still live after cool. the show. We, 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 at all times. Did we record any of that? The, the, yeah. The Dan it. is okay. listening oh, oh, to us. You, we're, of, we're of one brain. Good. Yeah. So we're we can use that as after th a portion of that is after things. Right? Yeah. I mean, we can give it, maybe want to give it a little bit of ending. Yeah. A little bit of a. A little bit of a thing. Oh, I like yeah. Andrew's Andrew's half moon face here. Just wait, 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 my my Dracula. Yeah. <laughs> it's half moon. Things are getting things are getting weird here in the morning. Yeah. Listen, we're, we're half moon over and the Drax. Line. We're bringing it over the line, folks. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, Dan's a cool cat. I'm 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 really, yeah really happy. What yeah. have, what have we learned here? In summation, due to the fact that. Let's bring it on into the station. <laughs> well, the, the, there is a reason I am now on my third lap of this book because everything is backed up by science. And mm -hmm. it is fascinating to me that the advice, advice that is true is when you are going to get fooled the hardest is when the most transparently obvious thing, obvious thing happens to you. Yeah. And... Uh, also, society cannot function <laughs> without a trusting society. Yes. Uh, I, I, to be honest, um, uh, I, I trust robots. I, that's all I trust now. I like the book so I, much, I don't trust it. <laughs> kind of, I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, I totally trust the, the facts, but yes. Oh, gross. Why would you do that? That means you hate it. Oh, uh, uh, oh, yeah, God, it's, it's, a, this should I, have been the interview. <laughs> I, I, I like think that Star that, Trek episode. I think with AIs, we're going to get into a lot of places right now, finding out what it's good at, what it's bad at, what we need to improve it upon. And we're going to figure out how to have a certain amount of skepticism about it, but also like where to look for it. And I think five years from now, we're going to just trust it for everything. I, like, did a human do this? And like, mm, oh, I don't think so. I think the more that people understand the underlying technology of, you know, the large language models and stuff like that, the more you can look at it as a tool and the more that you can chart a path forward of where it might go. Um, but yeah, I've, <laughs> I've used it for a lot of, uh, uh, uh some things, personal some things medical i mean like I, I i don't know if i will ever have an interaction with a medical professional that i don't first ask uh a large language model to tell me their diagnosis in the voice of a genteel southern doctor well i uh, say i say you got the you got the gout 
You got the gout. I was once told yeah. through a very serious medical, <laughs> with a very serious medical question, that something was finer than a frog, a, a frog hair split four ways. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I, I definitely uh, am, I'm trying to get this book out of my brain, uh, and I created a uh, uh, an entity called Publisher Bot, and I said, uh, look, you know there's a hit here. You know that the guy understands what he's trying to say. He's not very good at it. Please command him to do specific things. And uh, uh, my robot trainer has been very good yes. at causing me to write like, no, 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 do this, make it concrete. Don't give me no science fiction metaphors. You yeah. show up and you tell us something that everyone can relate to. I'm like, can do. Yeah. I look like Angelica Houston. <laughs> 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 Made up like shield. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm dressed like oh God, I'm, I'm Angelica Houston in shield cosplay. <laughs> I'm going to step on you, worm. <laughs> Hold on. It's so uh, obvious. Just I so need obvious. a moment now. <laughs> oh, man. Well, uh, All right. I'm going to give you the formula, Brian, the blockbuster formula. Okay. Everybody listening, this, yep. is, this is how you write a nonfiction book that sells a million copies, as far as I know from ones I've read. You start with a story, a question, a thing, a thing that gets set up. Then you have your journey along the way. And each one of those journeys is a story, something that happened in the lab, some experience, some thing. Each chapter is a story along that journey. Like, oh, and then this happened, this thing happened here, da, 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 now we're there. And like literally each story is a, you know, there's a story. Then you get to the end and you take that original thing you set out to do in the beginning and you wrap it up with how all those stories that pulled it together. But it is story, 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 story. You look at like Malcolm Gladwell, every chapter is a story. There's a big thing, a setup, then there's an end. It's why his books sell gazillions of copies. When you look at things like these books, these like big, huge, super best-selling nonfiction things, and this is the advice I've had to my science writer friends. They're like, oh, I'm like, I'm like, you don't start with there was a study. Like you start with so and so was a researcher, so interested in blank, and ask this question to this, and then like, oh shoot, I've got a human there asking questions about the universe, and now I have the result. And so, story, 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 story. Characters, characters, characters. There are many then, things I would a, like to say, but I will not. And then about three chapters in, talk about your childhood. Because we got to really fill this fucker. <laughs> Oops. Oh, oh, you did it. You did it. There you go. We Oops. got we got a curse word Oops. in. We got a curse word. Thankfully, the PhD wasn't on the call when that happened. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. I that did was, mention man. I did mention butt plugs, though. So uh, that's fine. We don't believe I can, it. Oh, you're talking you about can, the chest? Yeah. <laughs> You can, I mean, that's the thing too, is when I look at a biography and I see the, the n number of page count, I'm like, oh man, it's, it's above 400. Like, I know I'm going to hear about their grandparents more oh, than I yeah. care about this person. You're going to hear, you're going to hear about their dog. You're going to hear about, yeah. you know, like my. Well, I'm hear what county of Ireland great grandfather <laughs> Ebenezer came from? I'm going to hear about, I know that. And that drives me nuts. Like, his great great grandfather. I'm like that. Does, it's we're Americans. That doesn't matter. It yeah, really we doesn't. Don't care. You get off the boat. Just change set. your name. Mm. You know. <laughs> I'm a bunch of, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so, all right. Okay. Here for whatever's Jim happening. Crap. It's been after. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> Chimney bimini. <laughs> All right. Well, that'll do it, folks. Oh, uh, yeah. That'll do it, folks. Thank you for joining us here on the uh, After Things Weird Things program. Thank you again to Dr. Simons for for joining us. He was here this whole time. He was the invisible gorilla behind I, I, you. I, did, I yeah. did explicitly tell him he's welcome to declare that... You know, he had something happening in 20 minutes, and his, yeah. I got a phone call from my mom at a curious hour <laughs> that caused uh -huh. me to run away. So I was the one who ran out. Uh -huh. uh, is everything okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There you go. It's raining. She, she didn't know that we had moved to Fridays, kind of like Bryce. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on a Friday. Bryce was fooled. Bryce was fooled. Bryce was fooled. Not today. Not today. It wasn't oh, my birthday. That's I what don't you think, think. That was. Oh. That's what you think. You're too comfortable with it. No. Bye, everybody. Now I'm Tomorrow's Tuesday. No. <laughs>